Well, listen, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Uh, we want to uh, warmly greet uh, with a round of applause all who are watching online, speaking of the highways and the byways, all of you who are traveling for spring break, greetings to you. It's a joy to have you with us, as well as the ASL community, the campus in Bel Air, Michigan, and all who are spread around to the four corners of the world today, greetings to you. Well, Luke chapter 9, New Hope, I want to talk to you today about turning points. Turning points. Uh, those moments of life that we come into that you are one way before, but you leave completely different. Uh, it's the, those moments of life that radically alter your life. Listen, we all have them. If you look back on your life, uh, chances are you'll have a handful of moments in life, sometimes seasons, that you can look back to say that was a turning point of life. So in the midst of the handful of big ones, I'm also convinced that there's a whole bunch of incremental turning points, uh, things where the Lord perhaps gets your attention, uh, perhaps vocationally or maybe uh, financially or relationally or something uh, happens in which is a turning point into a new season of life. I want to talk to you about that today, uh, kind of positioned out of Luke chapter 9, verse 51. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but what is a turning point? Uh, well, here's a few different defin definitions for you. Uh, turning points would be this, uh, a time at which a decisive change occurs. That's Luke 9.51. A point at which something changes direction. That's Luke 9.51. An event marking a unique change of course. That's Luke 9.51. And the moment of an action, or the, the moment an action begins to move towards a climax. That's Luke 9.51. Uh, we're going to focus in on one verse of scripture and then kind of pan out to all of human history to see the major turning points uh, from creation all the way to the end of eternity. And then we're going to end with a practical matter. But New Hope, listen, as I was thinking about this over the last two and a half weeks or so, uh, reflecting upon my life, I've had about six what I would call major turning points in my life. Uh, but none of which are more important than the event that happened 30 years ago, almost exactly. And that was the moment that I was a miserable teenager who went into a youth retreat one way, and I came out a totally different way, all because of the inner working of the Holy Spirit, working through his word that called me to minister. New Hope, uh, listen, nothing can do that except the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you, this little key to think about for today as we start off uh, never underestimate the power of saying yes to God. Think of that. Never underestimate the power of saying yes to God. It was that turning point 30 years ago, 1994, which is why I'm here today. It's why I have this privilege to bring you the word of God, all because God in his mercy and grace chose a teenager out of all things, calling him to ministry. My friends, that's what a turning point looks like. A turning point is when you say yes to God. And life has some major ones, but it has some incremental ones. Well, take a look with me at uh, Luke chapter 9, 51, because here is a moment at, at which Luke brings us to a climactic point in history. It is the, 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 the turning point of this verse will shape all of the rest of the gospel of Luke. Up until now, we have heard about Jesus' birth, we've heard of his baptism, and then we've had this collection of stories about what he teaches, how people are responding, what people uh, think of him, the opposition that is opposed to him. We read all of these things, and then we come to chapter 9, which is a turning point in Luke. In chapter 9, two significant announcements happen. <laughs> These two announcements, one comes from a, the lead disciple, Peter, the other comes from the Father in heaven. And they are both announcements or declarations of the divinity of Jesus. You perhaps, some of you will recall them, where Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And then he zeroes in, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Immediately after that announcement, Jesus announces his death. This is a turning point. He says that the Son of Man must go as it is written, and he must be delivered over and put to death. But listen, he will raise on the third day. First announcement. 
The second announcement comes just a, about a week later. Jesus is gathered on the mount, uh, a mount of what's called transfiguration with his three key disciples, Peter, James, and John. And there he is transfigured before him, his face shone like the sun. And there was a voice from heaven, the Father, who said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And once again, with that announcement of divinity, of his eternality, Jesus once again announces that he must be delivered over and killed, and yet he will rise again. New Hope, listen, that is where we come to Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It is the turning point of Luke. In fact, if you have your Bibles, just right next to this verse in your Bible, write turning point. Because from this point forward, Luke, who's chronicling the history of the life, death, and resurrection, listen, every single step that is taken after Luke 9, 51 is a step towards the cross. It is a movement towards Jerusalem. And in your Bibles, it will say something like this. Now, when the time had come for Jesus to be taken up, he set his, what? Face towards Jerusalem. Now, different translations will say it like this. Uh, King James, he steadfastly set his face. It is that focused, fixed determination or the new, uh, NIV, Jesus resolutely set out. There was a resolution within his heart that from this point forward, nothing would deter the mission. Jesus was focused and fixed on mission or the Amplified, he was determined to go. New Hope, Luke 9, 51 is that turning point. It will move him every step closer towards the cross. It will be this decision. It will be this turning point that will march him step by step by step moving towards Jerusalem until one day he would come in to shouts of Hosanna, Palm Sunday. Why does this happen? Because he sets his face. He's fixed. He's determined. Nothing's going to deter the mission for which he has set out to do. That's love, my friend. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son for us. And Jesus sets his face. He fixes his attention. And this, my friend, is the turning point. Now, my aim today, like I said, is to kind of back up from this, to look at the six grand movements, the turning points of all of history and then move uh, towards the end of the sermon, towards those practical things of we find ourselves here today, men and women who are kind of caught up in this, in this grand story, this huge theme of creation and redemption and restoration, and your life matters. Your very life matters because you're created in the image of God. And so here we have in the grand movements of life, all the big turning points that we're going to look at, we find ourselves uniquely positioned as men and women created in the image of God, and God desires and longs for that relationship with us, and today could be a turning point. It could be a major one, it could be an incremental one, but I want you to know that I've been praying this weekend for you. Because I recognize that the power of the word combined with the indwelling Holy Spirit could make this moment today one of those turning points of life that sets you on a new course. So here's the sermon in a sentence. <laughs> Six movements define all history. One response determines your destiny. Would you read this with me? Six movements define all history. One response determines your destiny. I want to now back up from Luke 9, 51, and I want to kind of give a panorama of the six turning points of history, which will help make sense of the Bible, but will also make sense of all of history, and it will make sense of eternity and where we're going. My aim would be to equip you so that uh, not only that you have insight into all of history and into what God has been doing, but also to what God will do and to equip your conversations with people to give you those, those little nuggets, hopefully, of truth that you can cling to to understand the world around us. We begin with the first turning point of history. It's creation. If you have your Bibles, here it is. It is truth conveyed right there. One page of the Bible, two chapters, the creation story, new hope, this one page is the first turning point of history. Before this, nothing. After this, everything. Before this, darkness. After this, light. 
Before this emptiness, after this, the universe is filled with galaxies and the earth is filled with teeming creatures. Before this, only God. After this, God dwells with men and women who he created imago dei, that is in the image of God. The truth on that one page of scripture is in fact the first turning point of history. It is that moment in time in which we believe those first five words of the scripture. Here it is. In the beginning, God, what? Created. created. Listen, embrace that to your everlasting joy. Reject that to your everlasting demise. As for me and my house, we believe in a divine creator who created the universes, who created the galaxy, who created you and breathed life into our first parents, Adam and Eve. And he breathed his life into them, creating them in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we have this unique perfection where God dwells with men. Men dwell with God. And there is absolute harmony between God and men. What a glorious turning point in history which leads to the second major turning point. The second major turning point in all of history is the curse. New Hope, if you're tracking in your Bibles, here we go. Are you ready? This is, this is very, very amazing right here. This is creation. First turning point. Second main turning point, right there. <laughs> one chapter, one page, Genesis chapter three. The curse, those first parents rebelled to their own destruction. The scripture lays out for us what is wrong with the world. Embrace this and we begin to recognize the trouble that we are surrounded by, the suffering, the death, the disease, the disorder. We begin to recognize, as Romans 8 says, that all of creation groans as in the pains of childbirth. We embrace the curse, the truth of the curse. Why? Because we recognize that it gives us a framework to understand what's wrong in the world. The wars, the divisions, the disease, the disorder. It is the curse through which there has been a massive separation between a holy God and sinful men. The beauty, the perfection of Genesis 1 and 2 where God dwells with men is forever wrecked because of the sin, the curse, that venomous ancient serpent who bites into the heel of Adam and Eve by drawing them into temptation and seducing them. My friends, think about this for a moment. We have never tasted, we have never tasted a world of Genesis 1 and 2. The only world we know is a world of curse. It's a world of disease, disorder, and death. And when we begin to wrap our minds around that to recognize, okay, one of the great turning points of history was that God created everything and it was good, it was very good. But then that second turning point was the curse. And we begin to recognize that what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with politics, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with you, what's wrong with relationships is that this whole world is under the groans of a curse. But there's good news. God has not left us alone. He has stepped into this world to renew hope by giving promises. Third turning point, covenant. If you have your Bibles, here we go. Covenant. The entire Old Testament or First covenant is an establishment of God entering into creation to give his promises. What is a covenant? It is a promise, and these are unconditional promises that he gives. It is a promise whereby the eternal God who created the universe steps into the creation to give hope and promise of what is yet to come. It is God who resolves that he will not leave his creation in complete disorder, but he will, in fact, redeem it. It's promises from Genesis 4 all the way to the end of the first covenant, all the way to the end of the Old Testament. This is the word of the Lord who enters into specific covenants with people in order to give hope of a coming redemption, that one day he will fix what is broken. He will restore what is lost 
and he enters into those covenants with a specific people who he chooses for his glory who will bring blessing to the entire world. That's the third major turning point. New Hope, listen, without understanding this turning point, you will not understand the Old Testament and you won't understand the role of Israel, both in history and even today. It is critical we understand covenants. Now, we're not gonna get into all the mechanics. However, and there's some debate on how many covenants that the Lord entered into, but there's little debate that the top five, there is five significant covenants, but listen, they are not different. They are a continuation, one to the next, all of them interconnected as the plan of God is unfolding in the season of that covenant time. Now, this is a good chance for some of you to take a nap for five minutes, but listen, I think you're gonna wanna stay awake because through this, as we, as we talk about the covenants, you will begin to understand this entire section of the first covenant. These five major covenants where God enters into a specific covenant and makes a promise, and all of it will lead one day to the coming Messiah. The five major covenants that he enters into are with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. It begins in chapter three of Genesis. When that ancient serpent bit into the heel of Adam, from the very beginning of the curse, we have a promise from the Lord. It's actually a promise that he declares. It's a curse towards the serpent when he says to the serpent that I will put enmity, I will put hostility between you and humanity. You will strike their heel, but their offspring, that is one of Adam's offspring, will crush your head. From the very beginning of Genesis 3, what we have is that covenant, that, that outworking of God's plan, that he has, that our, listen, our father has not left creation alone, but that he has promised that an offspring of Adam will one day crush the head of the serpent. New hope, that's awesome. Genesis 3.15, it's the beginning of those covenant promises, the outworking that an offspring, a descendant of Adam would one day come to crush the serpent. As we fast forward, we meet Noah. As the Lord uh, liquidated the earth or purged the earth of all of its evil, saving just eight people in total with Noah. And after the flood, the destruction, and after he emerges from the ark, the Lord says this to Noah. He says, I will enter into covenant with you. My friends, the covenant that God enters into with Noah is a promise that the Lord will extend mercy and grace to the world, that he will offer a vehicle of salvation and restoration to repair what is broken. And in order to give a sign, a proclamation that God's word is true, the Lord gives a, a, a he, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set something for you. I'm going to give you a visual sign to assure you that this covenant is true and that my promise is true, that I am faithful. What does he put a sign? He puts a bow in the clouds, he, the rainbow. My friends, forever for all of human history, it was to be a declaration that our God is faithful that he is faithful to raise up an offspring of Adam who will de defeat this ancient serpent and that he will extend mercy and salvation and give a vehicle of salvation to a lost humanity. As we fast forward, we enter into this covenant with Abraham, Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and 17 specifically, where the Lord chooses one man, one man. He enters into covenant with Abraham. I choose you. And from you will come a nation of people. And those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And listen, New Hope, listen. And through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. It was a covenant that the Lord was entering into with one man who said, through your offspring, I will bless the entire world. Problem he had no children. What is God, foolish? Did he choose the wrong guy? And he's old. No, the Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. And in the course of time, Abraham and his wife give birth to a son, his name, Isaac. 
Isaac gives birth to two sons, Jacob and Esau. The Lord chooses Jacob, through which will come the covenant blessings. And he pulls Jacob aside one day, and he tells Jacob, the Lord tells Jacob, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but your name shall be called Israel. And all of a sudden, some of you are like, oh, that's where that comes from. Yes. The Lord chooses Abraham, enters a covenant promise. He is faithful to the unfolding of it, to Isaac and then to Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons from Reuben down to Benjamin, of which the fourth one is named Judah. And is it any wonder that one day there would be an offspring from that tribe who would be called the lion from the tribe of Judah? What is that? That is God's unfolding covenant promises that he would destroy the ancient serpent, that he would enter into a covenant that would give a vehicle of salvation to a guy like Noah and his offspring. And he enters into a covenant with a man like Abraham and he says, through you, through your offspring will come blessing to all nations. And then we fast forward to this covenant with Moses in which God brings redemption to a people that had been in bondage for 400 years. He raises up a deliverer, Moses, who leads them out. And at Mount Sinai, the Lord God of heaven enters into a covenant with his people, the Jewish people, the Israelites. And that covenant would be confirmed by the Ten Commandments and by the written covenant and the law of the Lord was put forth. Why? To form a boundary. This is what God expects. This is what he requires. This is how you are to live as, a, as my people. But what the people of Israel quickly became, came to realize was that there was not one person who could fulfill all of the law's obligation. And as a result, the law reminded them that they needed a savior. They needed a deliverer, one who would come. And finally, we enter into the final, this last fifth covenant with David. We go to this little town in Israel. It's called Bethlehem which is where David lived because he was a descendant of the tribe of Judah. And God goes to this town to find this teenage boy. From all worldly perspectives, he was young and incapable. But God, who looks at the heart, saw a man after God's own heart. He chooses David. He calls him. He takes him from the sheepfold. He sets him up as a shepherd over all of God's people. He becomes the king over all of Israel. And then... What does God do? Enters into covenant with him, 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7 is the powerful covenant where the Lord takes David aside and says, I will raise up from your offspring one whose throne is an everlasting throne, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. New hope, a thousand years later comes Jesus the Messiah, born in a manger in Bethlehem. What is that? It is the one singular continuity of the covenant blessings of God. As we contemplate this, this, this is no plan B. God is not changing his mind. As we consider this with Adam, the promise, I will raise up your offspring who will destroy the head of the serpent. To Noah, I will offer a vehicle of salvation to bring restoration to a fallen world. To Abraham, from your offspring, I'll bless all of the world through him to Moses, I'm going to give a law, although you can't fulfill it in your own strength, but my Messiah will. And to David, I will give him the keys and it will be an everlasting kingdom. And of his rule, there will be no end. God. That is awesome. First turning point of history, creation. Second, curse, a division between us and God. Third turning point, covenant. God has not left us alone. Let's move to the next one the fourth major turning point of history, Christ. When you take your Bibles, you see this right here. There it is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four books that chronicle the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. What is that? It's the fulfillment of God's covenant Entering into the world as one who, from Adam, descended as a man, and yet from God, descended as from God. And so Luke calls him son of Adam, son of God. Which is he? Yes. 
That's what Luke, he's the son of Adam, the one who has come to destroy the serpent to be the vehicle of salvation, to bring blessing to all nations, to fulfill the law and to get the keys of the throne of David forever and ever. Why? Because he is the, he is the eternal son of the father, son of Adam, son of God. And here is Christ, Luke 9, 51 who up until this moment had been teaching, healing, correcting, admonishing, rebuking, calling people into discipleship. Peter, James, John, Judas even. He calls all of them. He calls the 12. He calls the 100. Here is Christ. And when the affirmation is given by Peter and from the Father, this is my son. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Here it is, Luke 9, 51, the turning point. He sets his face. To Jerusalem. From this moment forward, you could just write destination Calvary. Nothing will deter his mission. Luke is a chronicler. He's a historian. And it's very fascinating. From this moment forward, that turning point where Jesus resolutely sets out every single step that is recorded is a step towards Calvary. He resolutely sets his face. Listen to Luke, who's almost urging us to see the direction the movement is headed towards Calvary. Here it is. He set his face to Jerusalem. That's Luke 9, 51. He's determined. He went, Luke 13, journeying toward Jerusalem. Luke 17, on the way to Jerusalem. Luke 18, we're going up to Jerusalem. Luke 19, he was near Jerusalem. And Luke 19 again, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, which by the way, that verse right there, Luke 19, happens on Palm Sunday. It's the triumphal procession. Jesus goes ahead, he enters into Jerusalem, and this is what we celebrate today. It is that triumphal procession. But listen, Christ is entering the final week of his life, the whole purpose of his mission. He has his face set, it's fixed, it's determined, it's focused. Why? He's here to fulfill the mission. What is the mission? The mission is to crush the head of the serpent, to be the vehicle of salvation, to bring blessing to all nations, to fulfill the law of the prophets, and to gain the keys of the kingdom of David because he is the risen king of glory. New Hope, it is one continuous plan of God to restore that which has been lost, to fix that which has been broken, to restore that Genesis 1 and 2 world. Praise God that he has not left us alone. Amen. When I think of Christ setting his face, I think it's captured beautifully in the words of one of the songs that we sing from time to time, which goes something like this. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good and the lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tomb, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born. And the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, by his freedom we are free. For the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. That's the fifth turning point of history. It's the, here it is, we'll move on. Move on, next one. Thank you, next one, I, I skipped ahead, you're good. Next one is the church. The church, when you take a look at your Bibles from the book of Acts all the way to Revelation chapter 20, if you're looking, here it is. The church with a risen Savior at its head and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, the church became an unstoppable force endued with power from on high. And what is the church? Well, it's a beacon of light, giving testimony to the risen Savior. The church of Jesus Christ, it's the global expansion of the name of Jesus. And everywhere they would go, they would talk about Jesus. They would, they would, they would talk about salvation is from the Jews. They would go to Europe in Asia, in Africa, and eventually to the Americas, and all throughout the world, 
the church would proclaim salvation, my friend. Listen, it's from the Jews. We have hope in a Jewish Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, the one who defeated death, reverses decay, rises triumphantly, and ascended in glory. He is the Savior of the universe. That is the message the church has proclaimed now for 2,000 years. We travel abroad. We invest abroad. Why? Because we are announcing that there is salvation and no other name under heaven except the name of Jesus. And wherever they would go, the church had a, a unified message during that season of time. Unified message. Salvation is from the, tr- is from the Jews. Uh, unified message. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Unified message. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you'll be saved. Or perhaps one of the most glorious announcements of all of Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. My friend, that announcement goes out to the world. Guess what's happening? It's a fulfillment of what God had promised Abraham, that through your offspring, all nations of the world would be blessed. New Hope, here we are. This is a product of God's faithful covenant promises. The very fact that all of us, most of us at least being Gentiles, have believed and trusted in Jesus, a Jewish Messiah, is evidence that God's covenant promises are true. We have been grafted in. God is fulfilling his promises. The great turning points of history, creation, God made it all. Curse, we wrecked it. A chasm between us and God. Covenant. God has not left us alone, but has given faithful covenant promises that point us to a Messiah, Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, Church. The Church of Christ is born. The Spirit lits the flame. Finally, we come to this last one, consummation. It's a fancy word. It just simply means that God will bring all things together. New hope? There it is. That's it. One page, two chapters, Revelation 21 and 22. My friend, now you know your whole Bible. You know the, you know the storyline. Listen, yeah, there's a lot of other details, but listen, you know the storyline. Revelation 21 and 22. The writer, the apostle John, pulls the curtains back to give a glimpse into the new heavens and the new earth. And what do we find? We find glory. We find that God has fixed what is broken. He's restored what is lost. He has taken all of us, that is the church, raised us up. He's conquered the enemy, thrown him into a lake of fire. But the church, oh, the church of all generations is now caught up with him and we are dwelling with him. Here it is. It is a restoration of Genesis 1 and 2, where God dwelled with men in perfect harmony. What do we find? Revelation 21 and 22, God once again dwells with men in perfect harmony. All tears are wiped away. Sorrow, suffering, disease, disorder has been dealt with. Christ is seated upon the throne. He has the keys of the eternal kingdom reigning triumphantly, and the church is gathered together. People from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language fulfilling the promise that God would bless all nations of the world through Abraham. And here we are, church, staring into the glimpse of the new heavens and new earth. And listen, there's a tree there. And Revelation 21 and 22 says it's a tree of life. Where did we last see that? Genesis 1 and 2. And people will take of the tree of life and they will eat of it and we will have eternity with our Father in heaven. New hope, that is the storyline of Scripture. The big turning points of history, creation, curse, covenant, Christ, church, consummation. Let's recap and then we'll get to practical stuff. Sermon in a sentence, say it with me. Six movements define all of history. Let's stop there. You know your Bibles. One of my aims today was to help you just understand the whole storyline. God made it all. We broke it. God didn't leave us alone with covenants. He gave us promises. He gave us a Messiah. His name is Jesus. He gave birth to the church. 
filling it with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's leading all things to an appointed end when he will fix what is broken, restore what is lost. That's the scripture. One response determines your destiny. Your response. Those major turning points, never underestimate the power of saying yes to God. Those major turning points when, when under the authority of Jesus and in the power of the Spirit, anointed with the word of God, you say, yes, God, Yes, it, it includes believing on Christ for salvation, but that's not in and of itself all because the Lord is constantly leading us to greater and more turning points in life. But most certainly it involves placing your faith and trust in the name of Jesus, repenting of sin and trusting him as Lord and Savior, major turning point in life. But what about today? For some of you, maybe that's the most significant one. But what are those incremental things where you come into a service one way and you leave another way because here we are, March 24th of 2024. We're kind of caught up now in this grand cosmic scheme, uh, the, this grand plan of God to bring redemption in the vehicle of salvation and, and your life matters. Why? Because you're created in his image, male and female. He created you and he loves you. So what are the action steps? I got three of them today. <laughs> Action step one is make your turn. Make your turn. What turning point needs to be made? A turning point is that point in time or a season of time in which the Lord is doing something in your life and, and it is making a change, making a turn where you say yes to the Lord. And life has its major ones. Perhaps you have had a few of your life where you look back and you say, man, that was a major one. That was major. That was major. And perhaps some of you are right there. At, perhaps, I believe some of you are in a season right now where it's a major turning point. You have your own Luke 951 moment that, that after this moment, the Lord is doing something, but you gotta make a turn. But whether it's major or not, I believe that all of us are at those incremental life stage or life transition moments where where there's turning points that the Lord is calling us to. Now, let me put this in practical terms. Perhaps it looks something like this. Where am I withholding? Uh, that is, I'm holding things back and I'm, I'm lacking faith and trust in the Lord, but the Lord is saying, trust me. That could be a major turning point in your life where you relinquish the control and and you turn things over and you trust the Lord. Or how about this? Where am I proceeding in life? Or just, I'm barging ahead, I'm doing it on myself, and the Lord is saying, hey, stop. Stop. Or where am I staying put? And the Lord is saying, go, get up, move. Or where am I ignoring? And the Lord is saying, listen. You hope the scripture says today, if you hear his voice, do not, do not harden your heart. Where is the Lord saying, listen? Where am I wandering? And the Lord says, focus. Stop being a squirrel. Focus. You're always wandering. Focus. Where am I relaxing? And the Lord says, move. I think that the Spirit of God is very faithful to give a very clear word to each of us what he wants us to do. And if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, then I think that the Lord will clearly tell you what he is leading you to do. What's your turning point? Make a turn. What, what turn do you need to make in life? Is it incremental? Is it major? Is it something you need to lay down, pick up, move ahead, stay put? And are you sensitive enough to hear the Holy Spirit and then obedient enough to follow through? Second action step. Define your future. What one word should describe your next five years? I've been processing this over the last two and a half weeks or so. It uh, came to my mind as I was thinking about my next five to 10 years, and I was thinking about, okay, what one word? And, and listen, I don't want you to overthink this, but genuinely, under the Spirit of God, I want you to just, okay, if you could choose, if you could choose one word to define your next five to 10 years of life, what word would you choose? 
What word would you do? I, I've had this uh, in my heart. I've, I've asked my wife about this. I, and then while I was gone, I was able to uh, meet with friends and go out to dinner. And I was able to ask a whole variety of people at different uh, seasons of time, you know, about this. Like, what would you, you know, like if you could choose one word, what would it be in the next five to 10 years? And I had different people say things like a calling, others significance, others contentment, others purpose, others health, peace, what would be your word? Think of that for a moment. Great discussion for the ride home or for dinner today. But what is the one word that you would like to describe your next five to 10 years? I mean, some of you guys are like in the two minute warning of life. You just want to be alive in five to 10 years. And that's good. You know, that's good. But calling, purpose, think of it, turning point. Think of this. Think of, think of this moment right here where if, if, if blessed by the Holy Spirit, if you have insight to describe what it is that you're wanting to aim and fix your attention upon, and you cling to that word, say, Lord, under your authority, this is, the, this is what I want, anointed and blessed by you. But then think of this, what one or two or three decisions immediately could you make to feed into that? Because in my life, I'm telling you, in the last few weeks, uh, not only did, was I able to define the word or to just clarify, okay, this is what I want for the next five to 10 years, but there has been decisions that I've been able to make to feed into that. Even on the way to church this morning, we were coming uh, here and, and in, in, kind of in concert with that word. I, there was another decision that I made coming to church. I told my wife, she's like, really? I'm like, yeah, really? But this is what I mean, define the future and then begin to make decisions that will work itself in line with that. Define your future. Third, action step. <coughs> Fix your gaze. Fix your gaze. What is getting in the way of your pursuit of Christ? And Jesus, when the time had come for him to be taken up, set his, what? Set his face to Jerusalem fixed, determined, focused. Now, Roger, uh, those uh, two slides that I went to that I skipped earlier, we're going to go back to. That, that word there, fixed his face, set his face, is intentional. Luke is writing, and it harkens back to an Old Testament verse Isaiah 50, in fact, in your Bibles next to Luke 9, just write Isaiah 50, because this idea of setting his face Harkens back to this prophetic word of Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, in which the prophet gives voice to the Messiah. Listen to what Isaiah 50 says I gave my back to those who strike. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what happened to Christ. The crucifixion story, the lashes, the beating. I gave my back to the one. Who strikes, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. That's the Holy Week story. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. That's what Christ endured. But the next verse in Isaiah 50 says it this way But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. Isn't that a great word? I set my face like flint, determined, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Luke 9, 51, my friends, this is the moment. Christ is headed towards spitting, flogging, beard pulled out, whipping, crucified. He's headed there, and he sets his face like flint. Why? Because he knows, he knows that at the end of Friday comes Saturday, and after Saturday comes Sunday, and he shall not be put to shame because his father shall raise him. As I was contemplating for the last couple of weeks this message, I didn't know if I was gonna do this message. I had a whole different thing that I was going to do, but then as a result of just kind of pondering and bringing before the Holy Spirit and just really kind of feeling, maybe I should, well, maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. I come into this week, a little bit uncertain whether I should do this message on this day. On Tuesday morning, I get a text from a New Hope guy. Out of the blue, he texts me, and his text says this. 
a reminder to set your face like a flint. <laughs> Dude, I can't make that up. Tuesday morning, served as confirmation that today would be a message on turning points. Not only that of the life and death of Jesus Christ and what would march him towards Palm Sunday and ultimately the, cru the, the torment of the crucifixion and the triumph of the resurrection and the focus is upon him, but also as a call to remind all of us to set your face like flint. Focus. Determined. And so the writer of Hebrews says, fix your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. What a glorious Savior we have. Would you bow your heads and our worship team is so gracious to come up. Uh, what's your turning, turning point? What's your word? What is it that the Lord wants to do within your heart as you get focused upon the things that matter? It could be a major turning point or an incremental one. Offer your heart to the Lord. He is faithful to answer. Father, would you now hear the prayers of your saints? Thank you that you have fulfilled your covenant promises. You've crushed the head of the serpent. You've given the vehicle of salvation through Christ our Lord. You have brought blessing to all nations, fulfilling your great promise to Abraham. You fulfilled the law through the person and the work of Jesus, our Messiah. And you've given an everlasting kingdom to the one whom we call Lord and Savior. Thank you that we get to be a part of that story. Have your work now in our hearts, knowing that you have created each person here in the image, in your image. And Father, as we dedicate our lives to you, as we dedicate this moment and the next five years or 10 years of life, however much life and breath you give us, may we be fixed and focused upon Jesus, who is the author of our faith. You're the one who started our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And you are the perfecter, the one who sanctifies us and renews us. And so use this moment in time. Use this very simple message on a Palm Sunday of 2024 to call us into greater turning points towards you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us here at New Hope. As we have looked into God's word today uh, at the turning points of history and how Jesus set his face like flint, that is with determination towards Jerusalem, I do pray that you have been encouraged and to know that the Lord Jesus did all of this out of an abundance of love to save us. We are so grateful for his salvation. Well, until I see you again, be reminded of this truth from the scriptures, that in Christ you are loved.